Hello everybody, welcome to another round of insect sculpting or design or whatever. I'm working on our little sci-fi wasp here, so this is kind of where I left off last week. So I'm getting into some detailing here and I wanted to do some further experimentation on the head because this is where I left off last time. I think it's pretty cool, but I think we could ramp it up a little bit more. So. What I'm experimenting with right now is making some brushes uh, using the extractor brush and some other techniques. So I created this one, which has some nice kind of cool noise effects to it. You know, maybe just around these edges, I kind of like to put them in here to... I'm kind of getting uh, some inspiration from uh, some insects like uh, this here, grasshopper locust type deal some of this kind of thing um, as well as some others just kind of mixing some details around I mean most of the wasp and and bee images tend to have sort of a lot of like dots let me see like this kind of thing like these pitted kind of textures which I like which is kind of cool and I kind of have that going already but um, I kind of feel like it needs a little bit more. It, uh, it's not quite doing it for me. So I'm going to do some playing around, uh, see what I can come up with. So I hope you guys are all having a good night. And it's not too wet or cold where you are here in Los Angeles. We're, of course, in the middle of some ridiculous storm that, uh, if we were on the East Coast, wouldn't feel like much of a storm at all. But here in the West Coast, of course, is making everybody crazy. So, my uh, head sub-tool here is about 5 million polygons. I think that should be enough. We could always, let me see, let's see what that is. Maybe I'm not at the maximum level yet. Right. I think I have some masks. Let's make sure we know how many masks on here. And divide it. We'll get up to 22 million. That's probably a little bit ridiculous, but why not? Let's have some fun with it, right? And so I'm kind of alternating the holding the alt key, releasing the alt key and doing kind of a crisscross to get this kind of action here. More on the, the corners and the edges and where I have these kinds of folds in the, uh, in the exoskeleton to make it look like wear and tear. I kind of like that, kind of cool. Um, and a little bit on how I created this brush. Uh, I just, right before I started, I went into another subtool and I created some spheres. And let's see, I created this one using a noise, uh, a Maxon noise. So if I go into the surface and I choose noise and I go to edit, I have the noise plugin. I set my mix basic noise to zero, so this is none of the basic noise, it's just the noise plug-in. And I messed with the grass a little bit, grass. I messed with the graph a little bit just to kind of play with it. If I go into the edit button for the noise plug-in, the specific one that I'm using is the Naki. It's the Maxon Noise Naki N-A-K-I. And I kind of messed with the scale a little bit and just fooled around. I thought that was kind of cool. Like I said, I messed with the graph a little bit, and then I said, okay. And then I came in here and I just applied it to the mesh. And messed around with it a little bit. Did kind of like a, um, maybe a clay polish on it and inverted this mask that the clay polish leaves. And did a little bit of inflate. You know, like this kind of thing, inflate and smooth, just to kind of break it up a little bit more. And that's pretty cool. And then I took my extractor brush <coughs> and stored a um, stored an undo history state. So you need to do that before you capture it. Then with the extractor brush, I pressed the G hotkey to turn into capture mode. So you can see that it turns the light blue. And there's just a little drag right here. And it kind of captures it. And then I end up with, you know, if I go to a blank sphere here, a brush that does this kind of thing. 
which is kind of cool. And I, you know, I saved it, saved the brush, went to brush, save as, and that saves the alpha. Uh, I also went in here to another sphere and uh, just kind of drew some random marks here, overlapping marks, and just played with that a little bit. And I captured that as well. And that gave me this this other brush that I that I'm using right now that what I'm calling the insect noise one brush. So you know it's like five minutes or so of screwing around and you end up with kind of a cool brush. Then now I'm using in these areas right here just to add a little bit of visual interest. And the advantage of of doing this as opposed to using. Uh, just a regular surface noise is, of course, I can change my brush size and alter the size of the noise itself and also the Z intensity, and, and that's kind of cool. And you could do something similar with the uh, with the noise brush, which is what I was demonstrating last week. I'm just going in here and, and kind of playing with that a little bit and, and then alternating, smoothing it out a little bit, too, so I kind of have a fade into this area. Kind of make it look a little bit more angry. Of course, I have symmetry on, so it's probably going to be a little overly symmetrical. So I'm going to hit the X key to turn symmetry off so that it doesn't look overly symmetrical. And I'm just going to kind of play with this tonight. And also, uh, I'd like to get to the thorax a little bit. The other thing I want to do real quickly um, is with the mandible. So I'm going to turn this off for a second. So you can see last week, I worked on this mandible right here. And got it to a kind of a nice place. This is something i got to fix there. Uh, but I didn't do much with this mandible. So... I can work on that a little bit. One thing I can do to cheat is, uh, let's say I'm in a hurry and uh, I want to just duplicate this over and mirror it. Of course, it also has, you know, um, hair on here as well. But let's see, if I take this mandible and uh, it is two million points with seven subdivision le levels and I want to make sure that it has its own unique name so it's called Mandible right now. And uh, I'm going to go into, let's turn on transparency mode. And I'm going to go into Z plugin, uh, he, uh, sub, sub tool master. Once my brain restarts, there we go. The brain started again. Um, I'm going to choose mirror. And I'm going to do over the X axis. And I'm going to choose append as new sub tool. So I'll choose OK. And it's going to make a copy with all the subdivision levels and the detail. Give it a few seconds there. Have a sip of beer. <laughs> okay. So now I have my duplicate, which has all the detail on here. So it's a bit of a cheat. Of course, I got to reposition it. So I'm going to uh, hold the shift key and click on that eye icon to turn off the visibility for everything. And let's see, here's my original. I'll turn on the visibility of this just so I can match the uh, match the position. I'll set this down to, let's say, I don't know, two polygons or something like that. Or sorry, two subdivision levels. Get the old gizmo. I'm going to alt click right here just to position the gizmo right there. I'm going to hold the Alt key and click on this icon just to reorient the gizmo. And that way I can go in here and very easily kind of match the uh, match the position of my original. This, in this case, it doesn't have to be super exact because I kind of just fudged the first one to begin with. But, you know, close enough, I think. close and you know techniques like this are very important when you are doing something quickly like if you have to do some 
uh, concept art and or something like that that you got to show tomorrow morning to your director or whoever it's good to know these tricks so they can save some time because now I don't have to re-sculpt all that detail I can just go in and make some changes so it's not so overtly symmetrical and obviously a duplicate but at the same time it saves me a fair amount of time and I also have the consistency of having you know similar details so now what I can do is I can select this um, version right here that's the older version here's the newer version it's always good to double check and I'm gonna delete this subtool but remember when you delete a subtool you can't undo that so it's very important to save before you do that so I'm gonna hit a save next here uh, the blue material, uh, best way to go about, it's called um, Mod Dirty Blue. So let me uh, pull up a web browser here and just do a search for uh, M-A-H Dirty Blue. Um, and we'll just call it, you know, ZBrush. it's a matte cap, so matte cap. And that should bring up a search that goes to this page right here. And here you have the matte cap library. Go down to matte, this one right here. And that's this category. And then we, hold on, it, my web browser is pretty slow today. I don't know why. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. It's either of these two, they're just slightly different. But click on this download it and then load it up in ZBrush and you're good to go. I have it as my startup material so you can do that by uh, going into the material li library with this selected and choose save as startup material and that way it'll show up every time you start ZBrush. So I've saved my uh, tool and now I can safely delete this version of the mandible. Don't need it anymore so I'll choose delete. And let's see, now we got this. Let's turn off the solo, make sure I did everything right. And turn off transparency, this looks pretty good. So maybe I'll go in there a little bit later and uh, make a few more adjustments. Let's see, this needs to be... I, mean, I want them to be kind of crisscross because that's what you see a lot of times in um, Wasps are really long mandibles. Take a look at our... Okay, well that's a bad example, but... Um, da, 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 da. That's a bad example, but in some cases you'll see that they do kind of crisscross. And uh, It's always nice when your reference refutes exactly the point you're trying to make. Yeah, a little bit. Let's see if we can find another good one here. All right, enough of this. We'll just do this. You can see that they're frequently, sometimes they're asymmetrical. Here's a good example. A little asymmetrical when they're in a relaxed position. I might be overdoing it on mine. Well, regardless, we can make a little bit more of a change here. Maybe something like this. Like this. Move over a little bit. Let me uh, click on this part real quick, and then I'm going to go into transparency mode, go down to the lowest subdivision level, and uh, remove some of this excess stuff. I'll use my uh, clay tubes, DW clay tubes. Let me just kind of knock this back a little bit.
so it's not intersecting with the mandibles there. Like I said, I still need to make mouth parts at some point. The uh, palps and the other, other little creepy digits that you find in insect mouths. That's always kind of fun. what I was doing before the insect noise let's save this real quick Slightly difficult. Come on, Pure Ref. Work with me. There we go. There we go. And we'll go back to this noise, which I really kind of dig. And, you know, just kind of amp it up a little bit. I don't want it to look too much like leather, but then again, you know, a lot of it's the material. You know, if I put on a really, well, if I put on a little really shiny, translucent material and then the end result, then these wrinkles won't look so much like wrinkles in leather. They'll look more like this kind of detail right here. Sometimes you can use like a cool like leather brush to get similar kinds of uh, kinds of detail out of this kind of thing. It's definitely my favorite part of the process. Like I consider everything leading up to detailing is, is like you know eating your broccoli and then doing your detailing. Well, that's like your dessert. Because it's fun to get lost in it, you know. And I always like the happy accidents that occur too. Here and get some right along this edge. You can see sort of the wear. I mean, this I may, might be overdoing it a bit, but you can always use a smooth brush to knock it back a little. That's what I'm talking about. That's when it's like really starting to go the way I want it to.
And the reason I like sculpting this on with the brush as, a, as opposed to just applying an overall noise, although I do that as well, is that the brush, I have variations in the amount of pressure that I'm applying as well as the size, you know, I can create variation that way. And so it looks a bit more natural. You know, you make it really small, like I like that. That, look, that looks really cool. So it's like maybe as I go towards these smoother parts in the center, maybe the intensity is a little bit lower, but the size is smaller. And so I get this kind of thing, which, which looks really cool. And kind of goes really well with kind of the dot pattern that I had in there before. You know, it's like layering on these different noises really makes it look very realistic. And then you can see, if you notice my brush, every once in a while I see that little minus sign appear. Is that, that you, then you know I'm like holding the alt key and digging in. And when you don't see the, uh, that little minus sign, then it's kind of pushing out. So I like to alternate holding the alt key and releasing the alt key as I go as a way to also create kind of a cool variation. What I might do is I'm going to hold the shift key and lower my Z intensity for my smooth brush so it's not completely obliterating the detail. It's just softening it a bit. Give it that nice insectoid look. You know, and I'll probably bring some of this detail into the thorax as well as the other parts, the mandibles, the legs. It might make the details in the legs look a bit different. You know, it's kind of like when you look at, you know, this, you know, human skin, of course, varies depending on what part of the body you're looking at. The skin on your face is very different from the skin on your arms. The same thing with insects. You can kind of see differences in the skin and the, and the details on the surface in the head or the mouth parts versus the, the, uh, the other parts. And so you want to be kind of, you want to have kind of consistency so that it all looks like one organism so it's not completely different. Although you can find examples where the, I think I showed this last week when I was talking about the beetle, like some parts of the details and some parts of the beetle are vastly different than others. But you still want to have something in the sort of same language, so it looks it doesn't look like you're just kit bashing detail. Um, but the uh, um, excuse me, yeah, I pointed out in previous uh, live streams this like I do a lot of sculpting of detail first before I do any poly painting because a lot of that detail that I sculpt in here, I'm going to also use for the purpose of masking, different ways of masking when I create poly painting. And so it makes the poly painting a lot faster and also more natural because you're taking advantage of the stuff that you've already, uh, already done. I'm make this even smaller here. It's like I, I love macro photography so much, so it's like that's a huge inspiration for me on, on all these things. I got a little issue there. I'm gonna deal with Make some details there. Yeah, my day's going all right. Um, Rain's getting a little bit old. My yard is flooded. My dogs are a little bit stir crazy. But other than that, it's going all right. Um, for those of you who are in the film industry, everybody's been complaining. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody everywhere in the film industry has been complaining about the slowness because the holdover from the strike is really uh it's dragged on a bit longer than we would like but the good news is that in the past 
week, I have seen at least here in Los Angeles and Eagle Rock, at least three different film, well, I don't know if they're different, but three film shoots going on, fairly large film shoots going on in my neighborhood within a week. So that's good news. That's see things are starting to kick in again, which is great because that's another thing that's been kind of a drag is seems to be taking forever for things to get kick back into gear and production to start up again now the strike is done so if it's slow for you right now hopefully that won't last too much longer you start getting I'm starting to get phone calls and stuff like that but uh, I you know I do freelance work so I work on all kinds of things you know whether it's film, TV, planetarium shows, scientific visualization, all kinds of different stuff. And uh, whenever it gets slow, uh, freelance work, you have to kind of learn how to relax and not flip out. Hopefully, it's always important. If you're going to do freelance work, if you're going to make this your living, make sure that you save money for a rainy day, like literally like today. Um, always have an emergency fund. Because you never know when the industry is going to slow down or come to a screeching halt. So maybe instead of blowing it all on the latest video game or something like that, put it in the bank and save it. That is going to save your butt when things like this happen. Because um, when you have a slowdown in the industry, it's uh, it, that's when you're going to weed out a lot of the people who haven't prepared for it. So it's important to keep that in mind. But it's also important to remember that when it gets slow, don't panic because before you know it, you're going to be buried in work. And then you're going to say, why didn't I enjoy that slow, down, slow time when I could? Work on my skills, watch some tutorials, maybe watch a Noman tutorial on insect modeling by me or something like that catch up on learn a new piece of software or read a book or something like that. It's always a good time to kind of work on your skills and not panic too much. But the people that are having the most problem, I think, are the ones that, um, you know, it's like when, when things are going well and you have lots of work and you're making good money, don't let it go to your head. It's not always going to be like that. And you could be like a star 3D lead on one project one day and think, this is it, my career is set, I don't have anything else to worry about because I am awesome. And then six months later, phone stops ringing and you're like, oh, I must suck, nobody likes me. It's just the way the industry works, it goes up and down. You could be on the top of the, top of the world one week and then feel like you're forgotten the next and you just kind of just got to weather the storm literally I hope I'm, you guys are enjoying my sage advice here I hope it's true <laughs> mm. Yeah, it can be a little bit scary. Um, the other piece of advice that I always give is, you know, your reputation as a freelancer is everything. That's what you're really marketing. It's great if you're a rock star, awesome modeler, whatever. But what people are really looking for when they're hiring you is somebody who's actually going to show up and be reliable and do the work, even when the work is not fun, even when it's tedious or feels like it's beneath you or whatever. Your reputation is everything. If you can do a good job on those jobs that you hate, or at least are not excited about, that's when you'll get called back to work on the jobs that are really cool. If you're like, if you cop an attitude, people pick up on it, especially your fellow artists. And if you start to make them do more work, 
they won't forget that and that's how you screw up your reputation your reputation is everything and uh, I've done a pretty good job of keeping my reputation good and even when I didn't want to I'm screwed up here and there every once in a while it happens um, but hopefully never costing too much damage we all have our bad days the one thing I will say is I've seen a few people walk off a job in a huff because they thought it was beneath them or they thought they were being mistreated and you do get mistreated in this industry there's no doubt about that as artists you get taken advantage of a lot and sometimes it's really tough to sit there and just grin and bear it and you don't want to be taken advantage of but there's you have to sort of gauge the situation and figure out what what's worth it but I've seen a few people walk off a job in a huff and never seen them again you know because the problem is they're leaving all the other artists to deal to clean up their mess and that's how you get jobs at least as a freelance that's true for any kind of job you know in this industry what happens is and I, I think I've said this before you know <clears throat> a studio is ramping up and they've just been awarded a big job or they're on the verge of getting a job they're pretty sure they're gonna get it so what happens the producers, the other members of the, the team, art directors and so on, usually it's the producers, or will go around and the first thing they're going to do is go around to all the other artists and say, hey, we got this, we need somebody who's really good at ZBrush, who do you know? We know we need somebody who's a good effects artist, who do you know? That's the first thing they do. And the artist will be like, oh, I went to school with this guy, he was awesome, he did great Houdini work. and." It's a fun to work with and save my butt or I worked with this guy on another job and he was fantastic and that and they make a list and that's who they start calling that's the first level of recruitment it's all word of mouth and so if they go to another or to an artist and I've done this before and they say oh you know we contacted so-and-so this guy uh, do you know anything about him? And I'll be like, oh, that guy is great. He's awesome. I love working with him. Or I'll say, oh, my God, that guy was a pain in the butt. His, his reel looks awesome, but he, it was not worth working with it. He was a jerk um, or whatever, or, or he was full of it. They won't call that guy. So it's like in, in the industry, it's not that people will tell you that you suck. People won't go, you know, most people won't come up and say, hey, you suck. You're terrible. They just won't call you, and that's when it gets really scary. And so you really want to make sure that your your reputation is, is as good as it can be for someone who knows what they're doing, understands their tools, knows how to work well with others, and delivers on what the director needs. Because most of the time, you know, these jobs are incredibly stressful for everyone. It's not just you. It's also the directors, it's also the producers, the, the PAs, everyone. It's a very high stress industry. And so the last thing you wanna do is contribute to somebody else's stress, because that's what they remember. So, you know, that's one of the most important things you've ever learned from working in this industry. And I've been doing it for a long time and I've been freelancing for a long time. This is probably the slowest I've ever seen it. Then the, and I've been here in LA for, almost 19 almost 20 years but it came out in 2005 um and this is about the slowest i've ever seen it so it's not fun but you're just going to kind of weather the storm and work on your skills and work on your networking and keep that going as much as you can and Hopefully things will get better soon. I think they will, because like I said, I've seen a lot of film shoots lately, so that's always a good sign. Yeah, good work ethic is pretty much everything. I like working. I love what I'm doing. Even when it's a boring job, I kind of like it. You know, it's like a, a bad day at, on ZBrush is better than most other jobs I can think of. Um, even Maya or whatever. Okay, I kind of just mess around back there. Let's take a look at, at what we've got so far. I think that it looks pretty cool kind of got some nice little micro detail going in here. What I might do is 
Store like a morph target. It's nice to store a morph target because I'm going to use the morph brush to come back in here. I'm going to store a morph brush. I'm going to go and find my H polish brush and maybe just just do a little, bring down the Z intensity, just a little smoothing here and there so they have areas that are more smooth and reflective going into areas that are higher detail. I think that always looks nice, look nice and realistic. You know. H polish brush is one of my favorite brushes. Getting those ang working on those angles a little bit so that when you know the light changes, you can see those forms shifting in the light. So I'm going to go back to that brush called the Insect Noise 1. You can bring us a little bit in here. Save this real quick. I still have this name Superbug, which is kind of silly. I don't know what I just did. Whoops. Well, that's kind of scary. Let's do this. Um, let's see this as I just say this fifty four. Let's take a look at the thorax here. Take a break from the head for a little bit. I'm going to come back and work on the antennas a bit, but I, I want to play with the thorax because it's such a fun piece of anatomy. And right now, do I have this? I have this still as Dynamash. Okay. So what I think I'm going to do, I'm going to turn on, I have Symmetry turned on. I'm going to store this. Let's see. Store this history state. Love control button. There we go. And I'm going to do a Z remesh. Let's do this real quick because I want to kind of guide the, um, the topology of this. So I'm going to use polygroups as a way to do this. There's other ways you can use. You could use creasing, but I like using polygroups because they're very visual. So turn off line and I'm just going to mask this.
So I'm just painting a mask on this part. Doesn't have to be super precise, but you know, just to follow the contours. I'll do Control W, create a polygroup for that. And let's do this. Asking and let's do boost mask. Boost, boost, maybe a sharpen mask and don't put this right here. In this case, I will use the mask lasso. Hold the alt key. Hold the alt key and control W. Back to mask pen and do this section right here. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. This, try to make it a little bit faster here. Control W. You know, the thorax doesn't have to move too much. Um, I think one time when I was working in the wings, I forgot to mention that one of the coolest things that about insects, the way that they work is, you know, the wings do have muscles, but at the same time, the main way that they get the wings to flap so fast is they actually contract and expand the thorax. So it squishes really quickly that helps power the wings. So there is some flexibility, which is why we have these different plates. I'm gonna control shift this, and let's do this. I'm gonna hold, create the, uh, what do we call it, select lasso. Let's just do this real quick. And let's turn on double-sided so we can see. Where's my double button? Display properties, double, do control W, let's do something like this, and then Key, you can do Control Shift X to expand the selection if you have everything hidden. Sometimes that can be useful. 
close up those holes and then with the control shift click on that and do control W. Alright, maybe that's not what I wanted. Let's do this. Perspective that helps. Do control shift X just a little bit. Okay, something like that. Let's see. Um, I'm going to control shift click on just a point that's shared by these two and hide this and hide this. Do control W. I'm going to do control shift click here, control shift X just to expand it a little bit. And there. Let's see how this works. Um, so I have this uh, history state saved over here, important for project history. And I'm going to turn on mine and I'm going to do, let's see, geometry. Zero measure. Let's try adaptive at, let me see, it's 300,000, so I'll try adaptive at 50,000 and turn on key groups. And let's do half. Let's see if we can get this fairly low. Do that real quick. I'm gonna turn off keep groups. It relaxes a little bit. So that's not too bad right there. Uh, kind of a quick and dirty uh, read topology using Z remesher. And I think, you know, um, if I did it by hand, would it be better? Probably, but that works pretty well. At least for sculpting for now. Um, and now what I could do is since I have that history state stored. I'm going to go in here and do a little project history. Project history. Divide. Project history. Divide. Project history. That eh, works pretty well. Then I'll just go in here and start to smooth. And then now I have a place to start and I can start detailing this. So I'm going to subdivide this up to let's see, 2 million project history. And just smooth that, relax a little bit. I do have a space mouse, actually. Thank you. It's right here. Um, but I appreciate the tip. Uh, sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't use it. I'm not using it right now. But uh, thanks, KJ. I appreciate it. Yeah, I like it sometimes, and sometimes I forget to use it. You know, we use ZBrush so long. Um, that I kind of forget to use it sometimes. Oops, what's going on? Oh, that was it. Okay. So I got a 2 million. Let's subdivide another time. Let's get up 8 million. That should be enough for now. And what I'm going to do is let's start by taking the uh, biscuit cloth and just kind of come in here and start to detail some of this. The problem I have this space mouse is sometimes it just gets wiggy on me. Right now it's behaving, but other times it just starts to get kind of crazy and, and that annoys me. But maybe I just need to go in and play with the settings a bit more. I have spent a lot of time creating my own custom button, which I like pretty well. 
um, as opposed to the ZBrush preset. So right now I'm just kind of coming in here and accentuating the edges and kind of going over these strokes. So I'll kind of like draw a stroke and then hold the Alt key and then draw over it again just to get this kind of like creasing kind of thing. I think the other thing that um, I meant to do, if I turn off the solo button for a second, these guys right here concern me a little bit. I mean, I like it as a design element, but I'm afraid it's going to get in the way of the movement of the rear wing. So what I might do is let's go down to that lower subdivision level and maybe move these ever so slightly out of the way. I'm going to take the move brush and just uh, let's turn on transparency and just maybe can always bring this in a little bit. It's good to do this before I get too far into detailing. Uh, any reason why I'm using the material? Well, yeah, actually, there's a few reasons why I like this material. Uh, for one thing, I, well, I hate the red wax material. I used to use the gray material for a long time, but one of the things I like about this blue material is it's kind of easy on the eyes if you're staring at this stuff for hours. It's, um, I don't find it burns out my eyes as much as some of the other materials. But the other thing I like about it is it doesn't have any subsurface quality to it. It's a matte cap material. Um, but it does kind of like do a nice job of really bringing out the details you know the so some of these details are very obvious I mean you can get kind of a similar thing if I go to the basic material but the basic material works pretty well too but I find it a little bit bland sometimes whereas if I use this I, I really kind of like the way that you know it's just basically a matter of how the uh, cavity detection is set up here in the modifiers that, you know, well, it's set all the way up to 100, and then that transition has been set in such a way that I think it really brings out the details in a nice way. So that's the reason I like it. Uh, the other material I use um, quite a bit is when I'm poly painting or when I'm looking at the topologies, the skin shade material, that white material. That's a nice one, too. But I, I'm the red wax material to me is kind of like garlic to a vampire, you know? It's uh, it makes me cringe. Oops. Let's go back to SK Claw. Kind of like making little marks here. save. I should probably save anyways. Yes, I am a vampire, as uh, Nandor would say. your favorite vampires guys my favorite vampire movie is Bram Stoker's Dracula which I think is really underrated if you can get past you know Keanu Reeves British accent which is admittedly weird it's a really great movie 
it's a kind of a nice tribute to filmmaking is what it really is um, but I love that one I think the mistake that they made in that movie because I watched it a few times and would you make the model asymmetrical I found that it, a lot of things yeah what I do is um, I generally sculpt symmetrically for uh, a large portion of it to save time and then towards the end when I get into detailing I'll start to make it less symmetrical uh, but a lot of times if I had to model a bunch of insects quickly or something like that the symmetry is a, is a huge time saver so I do make it asymmetrical in the end but I do appreciate the advice it's very helpful um, So the muscles would be on the inside and you want, like I mentioned before, since the thorax is flexible and it contracts and expands as the insect is flying, there has to be a little bit of give there. But the, the muscles are basically kind of like, um, they're, they're connecting when the, in the interior, uh, but they're not necessarily connecting there. You have, you have soft tissue there underneath, right, between that, but the muscles would be sort of on the interior connecting like this, right? Um, so depending on the insect, in some cases with like ants and um, wasps and hornets and uh, bees, you probably see less, in less of that soft tissue in between the various segments. You might see more of it in between the segments of the legs as opposed to something like a fly where the abdomen really does expand and you see a lot of soft tissue between the tergites, which are those plates on the back. So in the, in the case of flies, you'll see a lot more of that soft tissue. And you might even see a little bit more. You'll definitely see it between the segments of the tergites. It's kind of like the sim similar material that you would see in the larva. So it kind of depends on the particular bug as to how much of the soft tissue or the muscles that you would see. But if you look, like when I did uh, legs uh, a, a few sessions ago, I did show an animation of how the muscles and the interior of the legs work. Um, so, but you could see some t soft tissue. What I what I don't like in a lot of in insect design and sci-fi is they overdo the muscles too much, and they make the muscles too visible. I mean, one of the things is insects are really prone to um, infection from parasites or bacteria. And so they try and keep these uh, pieces close together as much as possible to kind of resist that. You also find that there are hairs, especially along the, uh, these edges here, that also serve as a way to kind of resist infection. So would you have like uh, ant decapitating flies, for instance, or a type of forward fly, that will literally come in and lay eggs in between the segments of the abdomen of an ant. They can actually, because they're so small, they'll do that. And that's bad news for the ant because basically it means that um, there's an egg growing inside it, much like the alien or xenomorph from aliens, right? And they call it an ant decapitating fly because as the larva grows, it travels from the abdomen to the head where it grows and matures and then finally the head pops off and the fly crawls out and flies away. So it's in the, it's in the insect's best interest to kind of come up with a compromise between um, having enough space between the plates for it to be flexible but not so much space that it's too vulnerable to infection. Obviously, nothing in nature is perfect, so you have situations where infection still occurs. You also find that there are like parasites that grow, and their little heads stick out in between the plates of the uh, of the abdomen of uh, of like wasps and things like that. It's pretty gruesome. Life is tough for insects.
like these kinds of details right here are really cool. Um, the exoskeleton, the material is called chitin, and um, it depends, again, uh, on the insect um, itself, but it, it is largely, chitin is the main uh, material that's made of, and you can kind of think of it as being kind of like your fingernail in the terms of that amount of flexibility. So, again, if you look at like a large beetle, of course, is going to be very thick and very hard as opposed to like uh, a fly, which is disgustingly squishy. Um, and then there's kind of like everything in between. So, um, and even if you look in the, with, with ants, there's going to be large variation in how hard or flexible the, the uh, exoskeleton is. Um, you know, it's like if you look at those insects that have that really iridescent kind of quality to them, it's really uh, it's a really cool thing, and and when I've done like rainbow scarab beetles or other things like that, kind of that's where you you use a lot of your uh, metallicity when you're designing the shader. But the interesting thing about you have that gold metallic or iridescent quality is actually a result of the way that the layers of the exoskeleton. Um, build up as it's growing. So the exoskeleton, of course, is the result of cells secreting the chitin, right, in order to, to create the exoskeleton. And of course, uh, insects molt like uh, most arthropods, maybe at different stages depending on the insect itself, but you basically have a new skeleton growing underneath the old skeleton. And once it reaches a certain size, uh, basically, the old it has to go into hibernation so that it can shed the old exoskeleton and come out with a new exoskeleton, right? Which is a very vulnerable time for the insect. But you know, it kind of uh, uh, it, it, with some insects, the way that the layers of the chitin are produced creates a refractive quality that refracts the light, and you get that metallic quality. There's a really great YouTube video. Let me see if I can find it really qu quickly. Um, that explains this process. Um, let me see if I can find. <laughs> All right, I'll have to put it into. Um, uh, the chat when I get a chance, but uh, there's this woman who does really great um, YouTube uh, videos on uh, insect physiology. Uh, she doesn't an animate them, but she does. Um, I think it's cybugs, but she has a really cool. No, I have to look it up when I get a chance. Sorry, I should come prepared uh, before I do these things. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's really cool. I love that kind of stuff. And you know, um, so I do. I have a uh, YouTube channel called Entomology Animated, um, where I do animations that explain various aspects of insect physiology. The last one I did, I did a four-part series on insect vision. And I'm hoping to do some more soon. It's just a matter of finding the time to do it. Um, the past couple of years, of course, have been rather hectic for me. Um, so I haven't had a chance to really dive into one. But that's the topic that I've always wanted to talk about and animate the actual cellular structure. Um, molting is another one that I find really fascinating because the whole process on a cellular level is, is quite, quite amazing. And, and you know, if you thought your teenage years were, were difficult, just try being an arthropod going through molt. It's not fun. 
Um, so yeah, I'm just going to bring down some details here. This is all stuff that I can use later on. Yeah, bugs are a great inspiration for doing armor. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they're the, one of the reasons I got into bugs is I was really into robots for a long time because, I mean, robots are cool, right? Uh, until they take your job. But up until that point, they're very cool. Or until they stab you. Um, but up until that point, they're really cool. Unless they have a flamethrower attached. Um, but up until that point, they're really cool. I think robots are awesome. And then, of course, in, you know... I, I, I'm a huge biology nerd and, and it kind of dawned on me the, the other one day, a fairly obvious thing, that um, nat bugs are nature's robots. So all, all the stuff that I love about robots in terms of hard surface modeling, but also the organic modeling that comes with uh, doing creatures and biological stuff, and bugs are the best of, the, of both worlds. Um, and you can learn so much from just, you know, really doing your best to, to try and do an accurate bug. It's harder than it sounds, mainly because the reference, depending on the bug, it can be hard to come by. You know, it's a lot of times you'll get reference of, of certain views, a lot of certain views all over the Internet. But then try and finding something, you know, the underside of the abdomen or something like that or where the abdomen meets the thorax, that can be much more difficult. In that case, you, you kind of have to order some bugs online and look at them through a microscope or something like that. You can get diagrams and books and talk to entomologists and that kind of stuff, and or go out in the field and take your own pictures. All of those things are really important uh, and helpful. But it's a, it's a really cool anatomical challenge and study to because to, it's so alien. And the other thing with bugs is, you know, Unlike humans um, or primates, where you can follow some basic rules of proportion for the most part, it's really hard to do that. Bugs kind of throw those rules out the window. Um, all you have to do is compare modeling, a, try modeling a firefly versus a mantis, and they're it's this similar anatomy. It's the same parts for the most part, but the the shapes are completely and totally different. And that's that's where you get find the fun. I think beetles are some of the hardest ones to model just because their parts fit together so tightly. And certain beetles, I should say. Um, and it could be a real mind bender kind of sorting them out. See, the Space Mouse is really helpful. It, um, I do like it because it does save... A lot of times, if I'm using a keyboard, my arm is kind of bent up like this, and it kind of starts to hurt my wrist after a while. Um, so the Space Mouse really does help with that. It uh, alleviates that kind of tension. So we have that kind of thing going. I can make a few more marks here and there. But now I think what I want to do is I'm going to just take a quick look here. And I'm just making some separation here a little bit. And some sort of tension marks here and there. I can continue to do this, but I think what I'm going to do next is save, of course.
Yeah, my favorite insectoid character that I've seen recently is it was it Kubo and the two strings or whatever the Leica animation. Let's see if we can pull that up. I'm probably gonna, yeah, Kubo and the two strings. The sort of samurai beetles is just so awesome. Let's see if we can find a picture of them. Ooh, the rain's really coming down now, I'll tell you what. This is, I love this character. It's such a cool design. The armor is so neat. I mean, it's not super detailed. It's not supposed to be realistic, but obviously. But look at the, uh, I love the insectoid kind of quality to the surface of the armor there. That's a really fun one for inspiration. I gotta watch that movie again. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was at DreamWorks had a art exhibit where they had all of the uh, at the studio. Not DreamWorks, sorry. I think it was Universal. I forget. It's one of the big studios around here. Maybe it was Warner Brothers. But they had a traveling exhibit where they had all the models from all the famous Leica models, and it was really cool seeing them up close in person. It's just amazing work. I think they do a lot of like sculpting some of the models in ZBrush and then 3D printing them for um, for stop motion. I'd love to do that kind of work. That'd be so much fun. Okay, so I want to add some surface noise here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the head here. And I do believe that I had some surface noise applied to this. The nice thing about surface noise is it's saved with the tool. So if I go to noise and choose edit, this is the noise that I had. So I'm going to choose copy and then cancel and turn this off and then go back to my thorax. And I'm going to choose surface noise paste and I might increase the strength a little bit. And kind of an overall surface noise. And then I'm going to do uh, apply to mesh. So now it's applied to the mesh. This is kind of an overall noise, which I think is cool. And then I'm going to do the trick that I always love to do too much. And that is to um, go up to here, geometry, clay polish, hit clay polish. So you can see it kind of knocks the noise back. You see it leaves a little bit of a mask. I'm going to invert that mask and then hide the mask. And so you can see that has that kind of nice insectoid quality. Now I'm going to turn off symmetry because you're right. I want to make this uh, more asymmetrical. And go in here with the inflate brush and just in various parts of here, hit it with the inflate brush and then smooth it. And then you can see you get that kind of really cool kind of insectoid kind of quality. Or it could do a negative inflate. Nah, I like the other one better. And maybe just along the edges here and there Kind of get that kind of thing going. I think it's a really cool kind of quality. I might lower my Z intensity on my inflate brush because it's a bit too much. Uh, hold on a second, I have to look that up. Black Common Rider. All right, hold on a second. I don't know that one. Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, 
Ah, uh, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay, I don't know why it's doing that. Bring the whole thing over here. Pretty cool. <laughs> nice. I like it. This one's very neat. Yeah, clay polish is a it's this technique that I kind of discovered by accident, but it works really well. Like I said, I use it probably too much, but it's still fun. Um, but you combine it with a smooth brush, and you can see how you get that kind of real insectoid quality to it, like this kind of thing, which is hard to sculpt otherwise. I mean, you could come up with a noise that's kind of like it, but it's like that residual mass that the clay polish leaves is... Is, uh, is really cool for getting that kind of technique. So it also looks like something that I spent hours doing, but I didn't. But the mask is still applied even when I'm smoothing it, which, um, which helps. You can also experiment with, you know, sculpting various fine detail kind of quickly and loosely, and then using um, some of the other masks, like Mask by Smoothness or Mask by Peaks and Valley. Those are kind of cool. They they give you some interesting uh, interesting effects. But you can see I'm kind of using the inflate brush as a way to vary the strength and the size throughout the surface so that it's a bit more natural. kind of stuff that looks really cool when you render it out. You can get it into a normal map or uh, other types of texture maps, displacement or whatever. It also helps to bring out some of these edges. So that's why I kind of sculpt those edge lines those party lines before I do this because this this can help kind of really bring them out as I hit it with the inflate while the mask is, is applied see how that comes out looking pretty cool Yes, I'm using the inflate. Inflate, see how it looks like garbage there, and then smooth, and it looks all pretty. So that's the that's the trick. You could use other brushes like uh, clay or you know whatever, um, just to see how it works. Because you know, depending on the brush you use, it's, you're going to get a different kind of quality to it. Um, but I just I use the usually excuse me usually either use inflate or clay. But I just like the way that this ends up looking. To me, that's that looks like what I see in a lot of the reference. You have little pits, and then these little lines in beneath, in between, that really look convincing. And the other thing that will influence it, of course, is the qual is the noise that you apply to the surface before you hit the clay polish. 
and how strong that noise is and the scale and which type of noise. And then of course you could do this more than once on the surface to layer different types of noise or even use 3D layers to bring them, bring them out, whatever you, whatever you like. Um, you know, because what I'll do is I'll go over the surface like this and add this kind of detail and then I'll do another round of detailing on top of this, kind of like what I was doing on the head with that um, with that extraction brush that I made. And then I'll maybe make some larger dots and pits into the surface and make it, uh, the detail a bit more asymmetrical. Because right now the detail is still very symmetrical. Um, you know, the thing about symmetry, of course, is it's impossible to see the other side of the thorax both sides at the same time. So if it's symmetrical and these details right here, no one's really going to know. Um, depend, again, that's a that's a time cons issue. Uh, um, if you have to do this stuff quickly, then symmetry is a, is a huge time saver. It's, you know, it's tips for the lazy artist, you know. I like how it's creating that wobble there, right here. That that's really nice. Um, yeah, the mask is basically so the 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 overall technique is create a surface noise or whatever kind of detail you want, whether it's these details I've drawn on before, surface noise, anything, right? Maybe slightly exaggerated. And once you have it to a certain point where you like it, then you hit with that clay polish brush, brush right here. Clay polish, not the clay polish brush, sorry, the overall clay polish. You can mess with these settings, but I usually find the default settings work pretty well. And what that does is that knocks back all of that detail and kind of changes it a little bit and but the clay polish leaves behind this mask that if you don't clear the mask then when you sculpt on the surface weird stuff starts to happen well that's kind of how I discovered this technique because weird stuff was happening I was like what's going on and I realized it was because that mask was being left behind from the clay polish so I usually just invert that mask so that the mask is very faint and you can see if I go into flat color you can barely see, oh, sorry, I gotta do control H to make the bath. So that's what the mask looks like, right? Inverted. So you can see how you've got that kind of detail there. And so now um, I just hide the mask, control H to hide it, and go back to my material and just hit it with that inflate brush and varying the strength. You know, sometimes I'm hitting it really strongly and then smoothing it, and you get that, or sometimes I'm hitting it really light. The, the main key is to, to vary the strength of it so it's not uniform, because that's that doesn't look natural at all. So you can, you can really make it strong in those parts where these plates kind of match, and you might expect a certain amount of wear and tear there, or, or just sort of the edges of those things, and it looks kind of cool. Maybe a little bit less here in the middle, so that looks nice and smooth, you know. And that's what's going to make it look really organic in the final render. And again, this is also, any kind of detail like this is something that I can then use as a part of the poly paint process so that, um, you know, I can use it in a, a cavity mask or a uh, smooth mass, smoothness, mass by smoothness or mass by peaks and valleys, or any of those things. I can use in the poly paint. When I finally get to the poly paint stage, I'll show you. But if you look back at my previous live streams that are on the Pixelogic live stream page, I, I did do a poly paint on my um, Japanese Hornet that showed a lot of these same techniques. So if you want to check that out, because I still have a ways to go before I get to poly painting this guy. It's, it's a fun technique and, and it looks really good when you have a nice nice translucent material applied and the final render.
But you can also try this out on things that are not insectoid and see what kind of results you get. It's good for a zombie skin if you make the noise really large, you know, and then you hit it with clay polish and you do this, you get some really nasty looking zombie skin. Yeah, that's a cool idea for using the move brush in the eye. Another animal to look at when you're kind of examining exoskeletons and how they interact with the soft tissue or the muscles underneath, of course, is a scorpion, especially the tail. If you look at the segments of the tail, if you get that dark black, you know, some scorpions, like rock scorpions, the older scorpions tend to be dark brown or black, but then you have that sort of cream color in between the segments of that soft tissue. It's a really nice striking effect. It looks very real. Um, I have a giant picture of a scorpion above my desk, which I use for inspiration. He's my friend. He has kind of a dopey look on his face, too, which I like. I think I might be done doing this part. 
and go back to doing other details in the thorax here. You can always come back and do this some more later. Just do this a little bit more. I personally don't really use 3D layers very much. I don't know. I just don't like having to remember what's when they're in record mode and all that kind of stuff. But if you're into 3D layers, this is a good good technique to put on a layer because then you can vary the strength of it and well, layer other details on top. If you're into that kind of thing. I'm going to clear the mask. Let's save this sucker. What tip would you like to give to those who want to start working in ZBrush? Um, I would say the first thing, tip I would give is devote 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes uh, every day making a freaking mess and don't save it. Just whack away to sphere with whatever brush techniques anything you can think of do it set a timer do 20 to 30 minutes a day every single day just like working out do that for a few months um, that's a great way to explore and discover things about the way the brushes work and the way the ZBrush actually works without getting hung up on saying I'm trying to make X or I'm trying to make Y you are just messing around make a mess right um, the next thing I would say is once you feel comfortable with that, then change your um, exercise. Instead of making a mess every day, try setting a timer for 30 minutes, take a sphere, and try and whack out a human head, right? Or a skull, actually. I would say a skull is even better. Do a skull a day. Don't spend any more than 30 minutes on it. When the 30 minutes is up, delete the file. Don't look at it. Pretend it never happened do that every day for another month or so human skull is one of the best uh, subjects to learn because uh, we're all familiar with it there's plenty of reference for it um, it has some beautiful wonderful shapes to it and uh, it's, it's something that you can accomplish within a certain amount of time doesn't matter if you make a separate piece for the jaw and the head do that don't do that make it all one piece doesn't matter just do it for 30 minutes a day and after a while you doing these kinds of exercises it's just like practicing scales or arpeggios or whatever or working out or practicing cooking an egg every day it's it's that accumulation because the biggest problem with zbrush from one session to the next is remembering where all the freaking buttons are and what they do because all the buttons have crazy names and they're all over the place in the inner interface there is a sort of a logic behind them not really and the problem is is that you need to reinforce these things so that it like if you do zbrush one hour on a monday and wait a whole week and do it another hour on the next monday you're going to spend most of that hour trying to remember where everything is Whereas opposed if you did it five to 10 minutes every single day with absolute consistency, that reinforces these things and you spend less time hunting around for buttons and trying to remember what this does and more time creating art. So that's, that's my advice. I mean, tutorials are always great. Watching live streams, watching my live streams, of course, are great. Um, I do have a Udemy um, course that is all the fundamentals since you asked i'm going to have to bring it up now um it's actually for jewelry making but it really applies to um to all zbrush i just kind of specifically targeted because i was doing a part of my work uh teaching jewelers how to use zbrush let me see if i can get my courses here and i'll show you Okay, so I have, speaking of, uh, two courses, ZBrush for, jewelry, sorry, ZBrush for Jewelry Designers, 
This is actually a beginning ZBrush course that covers all the different parts of the interface. And then I have another one called uh, ZBrush for Jewelry Designers Understanding ZBrush Geometry. And that goes through learning the difference between DynaMesh and subdivision surfaces and NanoMesh and MicroMesh and um, uh, all the different types of geometry that are involved. And, um, it has a whole lot of um, chapters to it. It's fairly long and involved. Let's see if I can find all the chapter list. Okay. Uh, curriculum. Yeah, so it's got a bunch of chapters. Subdivision services, pro tips, Z modeler, extrude, DynaMesh, Z remesher, projection, all the various different things, somewhat self-contained. And it's got 29 chapters, so it's fairly long. So you can check that one out. Uh, I do have this other course called uh, that's all about uh, Z Modeler, but for some reason they keep banning it. I don't know why. I've reported it to Udemy so many times, and I don't know why they keep taking it down and they put it up again, then they take it down and they put it up again. The only thing I can think of is that I did use some uh, reference imagery. Maybe they didn't like the fact that I used reference imagery in there or something like that. But these two are, I think, are really even though it says for jewelry designers, they're really for everybody. This one is, um, you take a look at the chapters here, navigation, files, lightbox, subtool, all the very different, various different parts of ZBrush. I tried to make the lessons all within 10 to 15 minutes and uh, as clear as possible. So you have forced me to plug myself, so I appreciate that. So go check those out. I'm going to probably revise them um, fairly soon and make them less specific to jewelry. Um, obviously, there's a lot of cool ZBrush courses out there, um, but I'm only going to promote mine because why would I promote somebody else's, right? Um, so, check those out. And then, like I said, but the, the best thing you can do, practice like, you know, just like you're a mu musician. Get, reinforce those neurons. Because um, I've, been, I've been doing ZBrush since 2004 pretty regularly. But, you know, I still... there's still parts of this program that I have yet to really explore in depth. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to that insect noise brush. Actually, what I might do is I'm going to go to lower subdivision level. Here's the advantage of subdivision levels. And I'm going to use the move brush to add in a little asymmetry. Asymmetry, because as was pointed out before, it's going to make things look a lot more natural. You don't want things to look too symmetrical. That's boring. So I might adjust these a little bit, mostly from the top view, I think. I am amazed, though, that and how symmetrical bugs are, especially in terms of their uh, patterns. Like if you look at some butterflies, you know, distance parts of two different wings. Remember, everything, every living organism is made up of cells. Cells are the smallest uh, individual unit of life. So you're talking about cells that, you know, on opposite ends, this cell over here and this cell over there have similar function, but also symmetrical um, configuration. And that's always fascinating to me. Um, the origins of bilateral symmetry are still a bit of a mystery, but they're kind of interesting. The leading thought is that in the days of multi, um, in the early days of multicellular organisms, you know, because the Earth was mostly single-celled organisms for, I don't know, a billion years or so, for a very long time, and then multicellular organisms appeared. And as that developed, that's when you actually had sort of a predator-prey uh, relationship start to emerge. And so we're talking, you know, waterborne organisms. You know, there's all different types of symmetry in nature. If you look at corals, of course, you have radial symmetry and trees with L systems or plants with L systems and different types of symmetry there. So there are more than one type of symmetry. But within animals, bilateral symmetry started to dominate, I think, after the Cambrian era, Cambrian explosion. And it just proved to be one of the better ways to navigate water and... Um, and to chase prey down or escape predators. Swimming, think of swimming. And so that's why bi bilateral, that's one reason why they think bilateral symmetry is so dominant. 
I'm not explaining it very well, but there's some really cool books on it. If you look at like Arrival of the Fittest, that's a really great book that I think does a good job of explaining the true complexity of evolution. It's not simply just survival of the fittest. There's a lot more to it than that. Oh yeah, Z Modeler is absolutely wonderful. The extrude edge thing, I do my, because I used to do all my retopology in Maya and it was a pain because, you know, you have to export everything. And then, you know, Quad Draw is great. I love Quad Draw, but ever since they got Z Modeler going, it's been wonderful because it basically I use it the same way I used to use Z Modeler. I mean, uh, Quad Draw in Maya and it works pretty well. Um, you can get pretty fast at it. <laughs> Z modelers are rated. Yeah, a lot of nudity in that uh, that particular video series. So yeah, okay, a little bit of asymmetry there. It's not too, too dramatic, but now as I start to the other thing I might use actually is a Damien standard brush. too dramatic, but oh, that's all right. Let's take a look at the old reference here. So a lot of this kind of pitting where these hairs are coming out is something I'd also like to get in and do a little bit more of, like you see right here. So what I'm going to do is um, I like this. This drag stamp is a new stroke type in 2024. And what I like about it is the size is always consistent. I mean, I could use for this case, I'm just doing dots. Of course, I could also use drag rect. In that case, it's gonna be kind of the same thing. But if you're using a more specific shape, it's it's nice because it keeps the orientation. It's a little bit easier to, to deal with the orientation. Okay, those are too big. So I'm gonna bring the Z intensity down. I'm gonna set the Shift. I could use like the spray stroke for this, but I like to have a bit more control over the placement of these things.
So what I'll do is like, you know, do a lot of this stuff on the top towards the middle. When I get to the sides, I'll turn symmetry back on so that I don't have to do both sides in individually. Sometimes it's nice to remember to turn on the whole bug, just so you can remember what you're doing, keep the detailing kind of consistent. I sort of have something similar on here. And like I, I demonstrated, it was it last time, um, how to kind of use masking um, in those points, those little divots, to place um, fiber mesh for these hairs. Sometimes I like to lock the screen so I don't accidentally move it when I'm drawing these things. This screen lock button is one of my favorite newer features of ZBrush. It used to drive me crazy before they had it and always accidentally move everything when I'm trying to draw it and make me nuts.
Hmm. Do you advise starters to do natural, natural, realistic stuff and then go into more conceptual, imaginary things? Hmm. I don't think it matters. I do think it matters to do stuff uh, that excites you. If you like say, okay, well, uh, I'm going to force myself to do really boring things as a way to learn, which, and I do that to myself sometimes. I don't know why we do it. That's a good way to kind of burn out and lose interest. So I think you should mix it up a little bit. So I think it's a good idea, you know, if, if you really want to come up with a plan for plan for yourself, it might be a good idea to alternate, maybe do um, a study of an of a existing organism, an anatomy study, whether it's a bug or a monkey or whatever, or a person, um, and then do a fantasy or sci-fi creature and, you know, alternate or, or that kind of thing is not a bad idea. I actually tend to, most of the time, I'm doing real bugs that actually exist in the real world. This is this particular project I'm doing just for the live stream. And uh, so I don't do as many sci-fi bugs as I probably should. I'm really enjoying this project. So it's kind of reminding me that I need to get back into doing things that are more fun. Um, although I find doing real interest, insects fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not a bad idea to alternate because it took me many years to kind of figure out what I really enjoy doing. You know, I started out kind of doing the same thing that everybody does because, you know, I didn't know else to do, you know, so I did characters and spaceships and all that kind of stuff. And that stuff is fun. But there was a certain point where I realized that, you know, if I'm doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, then my art looks just like everybody else's. You know, if we all study the exact same way, then we're all going to end up producing the same kind of art, um, which is a little bit depressing. Um, so I sort of figured out at some point, all right, I've got to do like, I got to figure out what my thing is and focus on that for a while and get away from doing the same robot that everybody does or the same fantasy character that everybody else does, you know, whatever. I just got to find a different thing. And that's, you know, my intersection of my love of scientific visualization as well as organic modeling, as well as robots and a lot of things kind of led me to the conclusion that insects are the kind of thing that I should focus on for a while because it gave me an excuse to really improve my ZBrush skills but doing something that set me apart from a lot of other ZBrush artists because not a lot of people devote their time specifically to bugs. There's a lot of creature designers who will do occasional bugs, but there's not a whole lot of people who are saying, I'm just going to focus on bugs. And so I, I saw that as an opportunity to kind of separate myself from what everybody else is doing. Now, which is not a bad idea because then you that kind of helps in your reputation you know the idea is that when people when a project comes up and somebody's thinking well we have something that's like a bug like kind of thing hopefully i'm on their list of people to call and that has happened actually that's that's how i got the job working on 10 cloverfield lane because i knew somebody who was working a bad robot and they wanted something that was kind of like a bug-like for the creature they were working on for that movie. And so they called me up and it worked out really well. And I had a lot of fun working on it. Um, so you got to give some people a reason to remember who you are. If you, if you do Wolverines and Hulks and Spider-Man, you're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And nobody's going to remember you because guess what? There's a billion people out there doing Wolverines and Hulks and... Spider-Man's and nobody, I'm sorry, but this world does not need yet another sculpt of Venom. It's just the reality. I don't care how much you like it. It's been done to death. You know, um, as the great Joe Sturmer once said about love songs, that topic's been covered enough already. That's why they didn't write, write love songs, right? Um, so, it's a good idea to find your thing, but give yourself time to explore what that thing is in other words don't just say i'm going to do unicorns from now on spend some time exploring do some wolverines if you must or whatever some hulks or whatever but just play around and give yourself some time to find that thing that really grabs you and psychs you because honestly i've been doing bugs now pretty hardcore for the past 10 years or so and i have yet to get tired of doing them i still find them incredibly fascinating um so that's just, 
it's just a sign that that's kind of the thing that 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 I really dig and, and that I really get into. I still do the occasional characters. I still do the occasional robots and spaceships and that kind of stuff, vampires and so on. I do love doing that kind of stuff as well. But um, I found that focusing on on that one thing that really excites me uh, helped me kind of really improve my skills overall. So I don't know. Maybe there's some bit of advice in there somewhere that you can take from that. But but whether if it's, um, you know, I tend to like, uh, yeah, I think alternation is not a bad idea. Every once in a while I have to break away from it and do like a character uh, or do a stylized or maybe a cartoony kind of thing that's less detail. I am kind of addicted to doing detail, so that t- tends to be my happy place. But again, if you do that one thing too much, then you get stuck and you, you don't really build up a range being a freelancer, you know, professionally, you got ha- you have to have range because, you know, I, as much as I love to do nothing but bugs for a living, I have to do all kinds of different things um, in order to actually pay the bills. So that's just the reality of it. Um, so when I get a job that allows me to do focus on bugs or realistic bugs, that's really cool and I enjoy that. But not every job is like that. Sometimes it's uh, a little more drab or sometimes it's exciting but something completely different um, you know doing the opening title sequence to Wednesday was super awesome because it allowed me to do some spiders I did other things in that but I did spiders and flies and stuff and then you know got an Emmy nomination for it so that's not bad um, but that was kind of like years in the making with all the other stuff that I'd done previously So anyways, um, hopefully you get some good advice on that. Um, The latest movie that I worked on is Aquaman 2. The uh, Hidden Kingdom or whatever. Uh, And I did a lot of the sculpts for the end title animation sequence. It included a few bugs, but I also did a lot of sculpting of imposing of Jason Momoa and, and some of the other actors in there. So that was the last movie that I did. And I did some other things that I'm forgetting. I worked on John Wick 4, no bugs at all in that. Uh, again, more title animation props and that kind of stuff, working with scan data. Um, I did some galactic stuff for 65. Unfortunately, it was not a very good movie, so nobody saw it. Not my fault. Um, what else did I do last year? Um, there's some other stuff. I work with a company called Filmograph uh that there are some of my closest friends and they do a lot of title work i love doing title work because it's a smaller team it's more creative um you feel like you can actually point to something in the screen saying hey that's something that i actually did if you're working in a larger project with a huge team uh sometimes a lot of the stuff you do doesn't either doesn't make it to the screen or it's so obscured or you did one little thing that was touched on by it 50 other artists so it's hard to say well that's the thing that I worked on you know so but also I just I just enjoy doing title work it's it's fun it's creative um and uh usually pays pretty well too (laughs) so that's that's not a bad thing all right guys I'm going to end it there for today uh here's where we're at continuing to detail I'll work on the thorax some more and the abdomen next week Uh, I might do some offline modeling on this, and if I do that, I'll put it on my YouTube channel in case you want to see the gaps in between uh, the the live streams. Uh, But I really hope you enjoyed the the live stream, and I hope to see you uh, next week. Uh, I I guess I need to officially sign up. I don't know if I'm on the schedule for February, but I've got to sign up for Wednesdays at 7.30 is when I usually do it. Um, What can I tell you about a Plen display? I have the... um, Cintiq, I usually have it at an angle. I like it. Um, I don't generally have a lot of discomfort to it, but I usually have it at a fairly shallow angle. So it's not like this. Sorry, it's not like this. It's more like this. Um, it usually helps. I, I find that better than working on a Wacom because in a work Wacom, I'm kind of like this. And it's bad on the wrist, whereas... This is a little bit easier. All right, guys. See you next time.
Oh, fail. Oh, come on, man. Again. All right. Bye-bye.